All righty. Well, hello, Lilia. I'm going to pretend we haven't been talking for the last five minutes. I know, right? <laughs> um, so good to see you. Um, we are here to discuss uh, your senior candidacy for the NEH grant, as well as your current project. So mm -hmm. first off, I'd just like to ask this with everybody. How's your semester going? The semester has been, uh, it went by quick. You know, students always surprise me in good ways. Good. Um, so I think I have a you know wonderful students in 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 both and teaching two classes. So um, yeah, I've been lucky in terms of the quality of students that I get in my classes. Um, engage, engage not everyone equally, of course, equally engaged, but but I've had a really really good um, semester. I, I can't believe it. It feel it just went by really really fast. And I what I usually tell my students is that the the first six weeks go by really fast and then like there's a slump and then boom it takes off after Thanksgiving, but I think this semester just felt like it just rushed through, you know, so but it's been it's been uh, busy, very busy, uh, but also uh, fulfilling in terms of um, working with the students that I got to work with this semester. So good to hear. I'm glad about that. What is your current project you're working on that you applied with our for the grant? I'm from California, so I'm from the Napa Valley and I'm in Petaluma right now, which is what 30 minutes 30 minutes from Napa um, but I've been working on a project for a while now thinking about a project uh, which is what I <clears throat> excuse me which is what I applied for wire on the um, it switched a little bit but but it started off as looking at race relations in the Napa Valley um, tourism and the wine industry um, but always uh, this uh, character of uh, Napa Valley's history at the center um, and I've been playing around with, you know, thinking about this project as a, as, you know, looking at different historical moments in the Napa Valley, uh, to looking at the Mexican presence in the Napa Valley that has been silenced and erased, um, from the official narratives of, 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 of Napa. Um, but, you know, most recently I've been thinking about, um, looking specifically, so I have stories of women that have, um, that are important to me, right? Uh, stories of women that are critical, uh, that I think have shaped the Napa Valley in ways that uh, hasn't been recognized. So lately and by lately, I mean, within the next, the last couple of months, I was thinking maybe this project isn't so much about race relations and specifically the Mexican presence in the Napa Valley. I think this project is more about situating different um, female characters <clears throat> uh, in the Napa Valley uh, to see what the Napa Valley looks like, uh, telling it through the lens of um, these particular female characters that I've been um, researching and you know studying and interviewing and working with for 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 a minute. So um, so it's a it's like a, a you know a project where I look at archives um, and it is a project that's been on my mind since like 2005. So it's been a, it's been a long time. You know, so I'm hoping that with, I'm hoping that with the wire, I, I'm, you know, if the, you know, regardless of what happens with the NEH, the wire will provide funding. So I'm hoping to um, not do anything this summer other than work on the project. So um, I'm excited that, of course, the NEH will be amazing, you know, but I'm excited that, you know, regardless of the outcome, there's going to be, you um, the you know the the possibility not the possibility because it unless the world unless something crazy happens in the world or personally i don't have anything planned other than three months of writing you kind of explained this already but how did you get interested in this project specifically specifically um when i was a grad student um in 2000 you know i was doing research i you know my 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 you know, what became my dissertation and book project is on the lived experiences of Mexican immigrant girls. So uh, when I was an undergrad and then when I started graduate school, I didn't feel like anything that I read on migration, I didn't feel like my story was told in anything that I read, you know, uh, except that Dominican, uh, Cuban, uh, Puerto Rican writers were talking about, you know, Puerto Rican, um, you know, the experiences of Puerto Rican uh young women coming into the United States, you know, Dominican, so on and so forth, but not in terms of the Mexican experience, right? So I told myself, um, you know, 
it's because it's kind of cheesy, but I was looking for myself when I was writing my 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 dissertation. So then I told myself, if I can't find myself, then I'm going to write about girls like me. So yeah. so then, you know, as so I said, I started doing interviews with young women like high school age girls in the Napa Valley. Uh, and then I needed to place their stories within a particular context. So I started reading a lot of stuff about the Napa Valley and the Napa history. It was so boring. I was just like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do this, you know. Uh, but in, in doing research about the Napa Valley, I stumbled into this character that's been thinking about ghosts that's been tapping, you know. Uh, it's She's been right here ever since I, I discovered her in the archives and in, in, in the literature. So it's like as boring as the literature was. I found something, you know, that that I found really exciting. So it's it's this uh, woman. Uh, her name is uh, Carolina Bale. Sometimes she's on the archives. She's referred to as Caroline, Carolyn, uh, and uh, she is uh, the product of a of an interracial marriage between what would we call today a, a Mexican woman back yeah. in the 1840s and 50s. You know, she was considered, you know, a Californiana, a, a woman, a settler, you know, yeah. whose family arrived in, 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 in Northern California. Um, so, and her father. So she's, she's the daughter of, of this, she's a product of, of, of a Californiana woman and um, this British doctor. And it's unclear whether or not he was actually a doctor, but this mm -hmm. man that uh, Edward Turner Bale, who arrived in the United States, who arrived in uh, what was uh, Mexico, Northern California, Alta California is what the history, or as the history describes, um, and married her. So then, you know, they had a few kids and Carolina was with them. And the reason why she matters to me and the reason why she's important to me is because she ended up marrying this German immigrant, uh, Charles Krug. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, who cares about these names? And, and back then I didn't know that much about wine. Uh, mm -hmm. But Charles Krug, we have a, we, the Napa Valley has a winery called the Charles Krug Winery that's yeah. owned still today by, if I'm not mistaken, by the Mandavi family. So as little as I knew about wine then, I knew that the Mandavi was a really important name in the Napa Valley history and presence and wine interest industry. So the fact that they bought the Charles Krug Winery was a big deal. And this happened in, in the 1940s. So when I was reading about, you know, Charles Krug and the Mandavi family and Carolina Bale, I found out that when she married Charles Krug in the 1860s, she was around 20, not 1920, she was 35 years old. Um, she came with 540 acres of land as part of her dowry. Okay. So those, uh, Charles Krug used 20 acres to construct what was then called the um, Charles Krug Cellar, and it is today the Charles Krug Winery. So he is credited credited as the founder of the wine industry um and she's nowhere to be found so i think like that made it really that that discovery in in 2000 for 2005 uh made her made uh kind of like created a pathway for a project where i can think about silences in the napa valley erasures uh, of, of peoples uh, in the Napa Valley beyond the Mandavis or beyond the Charles Cruz or beyond all these famous names that 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 are uh, um, part of what makes the Napa Valley the, the Napa Valley. So um, so I got into this project uh, because of her. And really, I just stumbled into her name. Uh, yeah. And and she's been tapping me uh, ever, ever since then. And I've I've found I, I guess I haven't really been ready, ready, whatever that means to write about her yeah. uh, until now. My PhD and my training is in ethnic studies. It's not in history. So I've, yeah. I've had um, I've had to fall in love. I, I've had to learn how to love archives. So I, I needed to learn how to fall in love with the archives that are there where there's bits and pieces of her life. So I've needed to be okay with knowing that whatever I write about her, it's going to be incomplete because there's not that much information out there. And what information that we do have about her is in relation to her husband, not in relation to, to her. Mm -hmm. And being okay with, you know, I'm going to have to speculate. Uh, I'm going to have to make use of, you know, rumors um, and and just see what what uh, what what comes out. So I'm, you know, I, I don't know if I want to, so it's going to be a book project. So I don't know if I want her at the beginning, if I want her in the middle, or if I want her like throughout the, you know, throughout the, the narrative. And it's just, uh, and then, I don't know, it's just in terms of in thinking about rumors, I went to the, one of the first times that I went to the Charles Crew Winery, I asked if they had family uh, papers or archives because sometimes wineries have archives. 
Um, and I was told that they didn't. So then I, I started asking about Carolina Bale and someone told me, well, you know, she died at the cook house and in Napa, there's a state hospital, like the Napa state hospital. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you mean the state hospital? And they said, yes. And I was like, well, do you know why she ended up at the state hospital? No one knew. So then I pick up the phone and I call the Napa state hospital to see if I can have access to her records. And of course, when I, they would never give me access to your records because I would need to have permission from a family member. So I wanted right. to attract, uh, you know, and then second, uh, the Napa State Hospital burned in the early 1900s, uh, oh. along with all of the archives yeah. that were housed there. So it's like, I can't, even if I had access to the family, the archives burnt down. So I started thinking like, oh man, so how do I, how do I, so I know she was institutionalized. So I was thinking, I wonder what happened. So then this is when the speculations begin, right? And I was like, I wonder, maybe I can think about, you know, um, you know, gendered and sexist illnesses that made women mad in during mm -hmm. this time. Yeah. Uh, but then like, I, I found out that she had lost one of her children. Mm. And it's like, I'm speculating here. I'm like, hmm, I'm not a mother. Yeah. Uh, but I can't, I cannot even imagine the grief of losing a child, right? So I, yeah. I was wondering, I wonder if that's what made her, uh, that was one of the reasons that, uh, why she was institutionalized or why she was uh, emotionally uh, uh, ill, maybe depressed. So I think there's a lot of things that I, that I, that I, that I, that, I, that I've been speculating, you know, about her. Um, and, you know, yeah, so so those are just some of the, the ways that I'm thinking about her, but also in thinking about her and the 540 acres of land, I also have to um, recognize that uh, she comes from a family of, of uh, settler colonials uh, and th that land that, that, uh, that, I, that I claim to be, uh, or that the archives claim to be hers, 540 acres of land was actually indigenous land before. So exactly. sort of like, how do I, you know, like, how do I trace you know, the, the, the land, you know, was it the Guapos, was it the Pomos, was it uh, Miwok? Those are some of the indigenous tribes up here yeah. in the in the Napa Valley area. And I think that complicates that, you know, I mean, the story is still about her, but I think it adds to the layers of, of the way that people have written about the Napa Valley and the ways in which I imagine writing about it. What is the most interesting thing you have discovered so far about this, through this project? Um, I think finding out about her was really, interesting and this was in like 2000 again 2004 2005 and I remember being uh it, 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 it now it's called uh I, I don't think it's called Barrows anymore in it at, at you know at UC Berkeley in, on the fifth floor where ethnic studies was at and I remember being there with my homegirls and reading like reading pretending to be you know to, to to do some hardcore grad student work and I remember like reading about it and pausing and just being like huh you know, like, why is he getting all the credit and not her, you know, is, is what I is what I thought. So that was like one of those like, huh, you know, like a really, really interesting moment. Um, another moment was, um, so, so a second woman that I want to write about, and this is going to bring me to the 1960s, is um, that is uh, writing about Amelia Seja. And Amelia Seja is a CEO of Seja Vineyards, the second uh, trademark uh, Mexican-American winery in, in, in Napa. And Amelia came to... Um, uh, St. Helena in the 1960s. She was 12 years old. Um, and I had the pleasure of interviewing her a few years ago. Just such a wonderful, amazing storyteller. Um, and I, so what, 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 uh, what was really interesting about that particular moment and the way she tells her story is that um, the school district didn't know what to do with her when she arrived to St. Helena. So they placed her in special ed courses, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then she said, yeah, people always ask me, you know, like, do I get angry that I was placed in special ed courses when, you know, when I, um, when I didn't have a, a learning disability or something, you know, um, but she said within six months, I was fluent in English and I was learning how to speak French. Mm -hmm. uh, so that go-getter attitude that, that she uh, had then led her and her uh, husband, uh, Pedro, and her brother-in-law to buy land during a time when there was a recession happening in California. This was in the 1990s, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that, that you know, like, I was like, whoa, you went from, you know, uh, attending, tending to the grapes uh, and the vineyard to, you know, 30 years later to being the boss. Yeah. 
you know, like being the boss. Um, and then in, in the way that she was also telling me the story of, of, of Napa Valley in the 1960s, she also mentioned to me that a lot of African American men, and I don't, I haven't done this research yet, but a lot of African American men were bussed in from the Tenderloin in San Francisco to the Napa Valley to uh, pick up, to, to pick groups. And this was in the 1960s. So I was like, okay. So when I write about her, I need to talk about these other race relations that, you know, happening, you know, during, during the time. And then I guess that the last interest or two more interesting things, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the third is um, I, I, I had a third character that I want to, that I'm right that I'm writing about is uh, Vanessa Robledo, who was the daughter of the Robledo winery, the first trademarked winery in the Napa Valley. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way that um, she, the love and relationship she has to the land mm-hmm. um, and how when she was little, her grandfather used to tell her, if you teach me a word of English a day, mm-hmm. because her grandfather was an, an immigrant, he didn't speak English, I'll teach you about the land. You know, so I think it's like those moments where, um, you know, that I was just like, wow, like that just made me pause yeah. and think about, you know, what does it mean to tell those stories in the Napa Valley where it's about wine and food and leisure. And there's this really touching, loving moments uh, that I think are really, really important to, 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 to tell. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the last one, there's been an increase of um, indigenous peoples coming into the Napa Valley and the Sonoma Valley from uh, Oaxaca, for example, mm-hmm. um, and uh, struggling with, you know, language and working in the wine industry when we have all these fires, you know, happening in all these uh, uh, contexts, mm-hmm. uh, consequences of, of climate, climate change. So I think there's something there, too, in terms of thinking about, um, you know, how climate uh, change is producing climate refugees mm-hmm. who then end up laboring in places like the Napa Valley or the Sonoma Valley, for example, and then uh, experiencing climate change here with fires and having to work in the in the uh, uh, fields. I, I remember a few years ago when there was a fire, some fire, they're almost on a yearly basis now in Napa. Um, there were pictures of farm workers with fires in the background. I don't know if you, there was just particular images that was floating around. So it's sort of like, how do these, um, you know, climate refugees end up working under, encounter climate change, continue to uh, experience climate change, you know, throughout, throughout their, throughout their journey. So Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, that's a little less on, um, I haven't explored that as, as, as much, but it's, but, it, you know, I'm thinking of the work of, uh, there's a journalist named Todd Miller who wrote a, a beautiful book called Storming the Wall about climate refugees and also a book by Harsha Walia. Uh, and the book is called Border and Rule about off-border and sh- uh, off, what did she call it? Uh, offshoring border enforcement um, that I think are, are making me think about, you know, contemporary migration into the Napa Valley, specifically the impact on women, like, you know, women uh, migrants in, in the United States. Yeah, I'm sorry, not in the United States, in the Napa Valley. So I think those yeah. are, Things that have been really surprising to me um, that that I think, you know, I feel um, excited. I mean, I, I feel right now as I'm talking to you, like I feel excited about the project. Yeah. And I feel moved um, and I feel emotional, like now is my home. So it's like I, I feel emotional, like emotions about, the you know, the project. Mm-hmm. And I think that we have to. You know, as researchers, as thinkers, I think we have to um, be, we have to love what we do. And we have to, like, for me, I want to tell a story, a different story of the Napa Valley. And, you know, if anything, to, to um, I don't know, like, maybe people can think about the Napa Valley in a different way. And it's kind of, you know, when I was, you know, going through, uh, when I was in grad school, some of my friends told me, I think about the work is now when I go to the Napa Valley or, you know, uh, the Napa Valley feels like, you know, as some journalists have written about it, like a Disneyland. And when I go to Disneyland, I think about the workers. So it's sort of like, you know, what happens when we when we think about unlikely characters when yeah. we come to a place like the Napa Valley? So I think uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm hoping that you know, things remain steady and that I can just oof, do this on over, over, I'm not everything, but like really sink my teeth into the writing in over the summer. So I'm glad The Wire selected me uh, yeah. to, 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 to do, to, to, you know, for this particular project. 
Well, it sounds like it is a very interesting and moving project. Why do you think humanities research in general or research like you're doing right now is valuable? I think I'll answer it this way. Um, when I started um, writing and when I started publishing, I, 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 you know, I don't come from a family of traditionally uh, trained intellectuals or academics. My dad taught himself how to read and write, right? When he was eight years old and my mom has a sixth grade education. So I don't come from like, I wasn't supposed to do this, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I was lucky uh, that I grew up in a family where, you know, not only did my mom and dad push us into doing well in school, but also I was always teacher's pet. You know, so it's sort of like this idea of like, she's gifted, she's smart. Like it was, it was something that I, that I benefited from. So when we migrated to the United States, I, I never, I tell this to my students, I didn't think I was dumb. I just didn't know the language. And once I learned the language, I was like, oh, okay, I can, I can, I can kind of do this. But I never thought about being a professor, certainly not being a writer. Um, I, I just didn't know what was going to happen, but. I ended up in 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 this in this track for various reasons. It wasn't, you know, <laughs> so there were some pieces were in place for me to to be where you know, uh, um, thinking about the importance of, of of humanities. I mean, I think about humanity, and I think about uh, how I want my work to be humane. Uh, someone just told me um, they read my book, uh, and I, I and I asked them, "What did you think about the book?" And they said, "It has a lot of heart in it." You know, mm -hmm. so that that made me feel I was like, oh, like, thank you. Like that made me feel really uh, warm inside um, when I have I, I'm, I haven't been given book talks anymore because the book came out three years ago. But when I was giving book talks, people were coming. Women were coming up to me. Uh, Latinx women were coming up to me and telling me that they could relate to the book, that they could um see themselves reflected in the kind of work that, that I did. So it wasn't until then that I was like, oh, well, I wrote the book for you, you know? So, so I think like for me, the, the humanities, um, I think about humanity and I think about humanizing um, the, the subjects, you know, the interlocutors, the characters that we write about. And, and my goal is that in, in humanizing there are stories in humanizing these characters and we can begin to think about, and this is a way that I think about teaching as well. We can begin to think about um, humanity uh, in a different way. You know, what happens when, when we begin to see each other as, as humans and, and when we begin to recognize each other's humanity. So I, so I feel like for me, the, the, the humanities um, and at least the humanity that I bring into my research and into the classroom and the one that's reciprocated either, you know, through, friends or colleagues or whoever, everyday people, I think it's really important. And I don't think, you know, I, I don't think it's something that we should, you know, I think we should pay attention to it. One more question. If for anyone who may be interested in the project you're working on, is there anything you would recommend they read until your book comes out? Right. So what can we read in the meantime? Yeah, I, I wrote this really interesting essay. It's called When Chavez, Cesar Chavez and the Lord is Worth That Came to Napa about some statues, um, a statue in the Napa Valley that was uh, this uh, uh, Michael Holcomb, who's the really, um, uh, he, he owns a lot of property in the Napa Valley. He wanted, he commissioned, um, I can't remember his title, uh, commissioned this man to build the statue of Dolores Huerta and Chavez, farm work, leaders of the uh, you know, uh, Farm Workers Union. Of course, Chavez passed away uh, and Dolores Huerta is still alive and well. So I wrote an article about what it meant to, um, to have those statues uh, for for you know Mr. Holcomb to commission and have these statues placed you know in a very public you know place in the Napa Valley and I had a lot of fun uh, researching um, and putting together histories of the Napa Valley that that we haven't heard about. It's a short ten page essay, uh -huh. um, so I, so I think I think that's a, that's that will lead people I think into how is she thinking about writing about the Napa Valley I think that's a good way of thinking about the Napa Valley maybe yeah. if people want to come to to Napa just you know check out the, those statues at the Lourdes Huerta and Cesar Chavez statue Michael Holcomb also commissioned uh, this uh, woman uh, to do a, a mural which is on second and school street right across the street from the post office in downtown Napa and uh -huh. it's a really beautiful mural uh, where um, the, the thought and idea behind the mural was to bring out the indigenous presence, you know, in Napa. 
And the mural is called Tuesday Morning 1720. And it's a mural of like, you know, a, a woman in the middle and like two, pe- two, like two or three other people in the background and they're basket weavers, you know, and if I'm not mistaken, the the, the guapo uh, were basket weavers in, 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 in the region. Um, but when I say the mural is stunning. So when I saw the mural, I was like, what would Tuesday morning 2020 look like for those people, right? So thinking about what are some of the ways that we um, that we move away from compartmentalizing history and think about the ways that the past bleeds into the present or the past, you know, uh, flows into the present. Mm-hmm. So also, like, I would tell people come to the Napa Valley and, and look at the murals and look at the art and see what's there, what's missing, question it, uh, elaborate on it. Um, I, I, I guess the most recent article that I wrote doesn't have to do with this project, but it has to do with, uh, with the only ethnic studies program in Napa uh, that was um, eliminated in uh, June of 2020. So I wrote a piece on that that's coming out um, anytime now. I, I yeah. did, we did the proofs already. Um, so it's, it's, it tells a different story of the Napa Valley in terms of the schooling practices uh, and in terms of, you know, what does it mean to be a student of Latinx descent uh, in a town, in a school district where 56% of the students are Latinx, but there's very little um, reflection uh, curriculum that, that feeds um, the hunger of, 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 of 56% of the student population. So I think it's a, Really interesting piece that, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I think it's gonna, it, it, I, I wrote an article to the uh, op-ed to, um, a letter to the editor in, in Napa and it ruffled some feathers. So I, I got some, <laughs> some pretty interesting, uh, like uh, feedback from, from not feedback, but like attacks. So, it's, so I, I'm also well aware that the Napa Valley is still very conservative in different ways and, yeah. and you know, I, protective. I was labeled or, you know, uh, people talked to me, talked about me as if I wasn't the product of Napa, like, oh, who is this professor in Wyoming writing about Napa? And it's like, right, exactly. I've been writing about Napa since, you know, for a long time, you know, yeah. so, so it's, it's been, it's been interesting, but I would say those two, you know, those two pieces and, um, and, you know, if, if people, if you know of people uh, that ever come to Napa, think about the workers, uh, think about um, wine, whenever we drink wine, I know that we love wine at Wyoming, you know, so whenever yeah. there's wine events, I'm like, oh, where is this wine from? And, you know, who picked those grapes, you know, to to yeah. to make this wine possible? And I'm not saying don't drink wine. I'm just saying, you know, it's important <laughs> to to yeah. think about to think about the, you know, where these things come from. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and visit the, the, the murals. There's another mural uh, also commissioned by Michael Holcomb one that saw school and Third Street beautiful mural on, on farm workers as well. So I think, you know, paying attention to those things, I think are, are, are important when, when visiting, you know, downtown Napa. Totally. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me. I'm, thank you. I'm honestly like, the more you describe your work, I'm just like so excited to hear about it. Um, yeah. But yeah, thank you so much for thank you. speaking for, to me just a little bit. Thank you.